The topic that has been assigned to me is Christ, our substitute. And I invite you to take your Bibles and turn with me to Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 54. I want us to look at the very heart of the Bible, at the very heart of the Old Testament, this Mount Everest chapter, Isaiah chapter 53. I want to begin by reading verses 4 through 6. I intend to look at the entire servant song, but I want to begin by reading the very center three verses of this servant song. Christ our substitute. I begin reading in verse 4, God's inspired, inerrant, and infallible word. Surely our griefs he himself bore, and our sorrows he carried. Yet we ourselves esteemed him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was pierced through for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The chastening for our well-being fell upon him And by his scourging, we are healed. All of us, like sheep, have gone astray. Each one of us has turned to his own way. But the Lord has caused the iniquity of us all to fall on him. That Jesus died upon the cross 2,000 years ago is an undisputed fact of history. That Christ was crucified in the holy city of Jerusalem during the Roman occupation of Palestine is accepted by virtually all. That Jesus of Nazareth was put to death at the hands of Roman soldiers through the barbaric form of execution known as crucifixion is agreed upon by virtually all historians. But the real issue before us is not that he did die or where he died or how he died. The burning issue is why. Why did he die? What was the purpose of God in the death of His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ? What was God's intent in the cross? What did God intend to accomplish as He delivered over His Son at Calvary? Here is God's own commentary. This is the gospel according to Isaiah. This is God's own theological commentary upon the death of His own Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And to put it in one word, it is the word substitution, that Jesus Christ stood in the place of guilty, hell-bound, cursed sinners as He was lifted up upon the cross. He died in our place. He bore our sins. He suffered the curse on our behalf. Isaiah 53 finds itself in a very climactic position in the book of Isaiah. The major prophet of the major prophets. In Isaiah 6, there is a vision of Christ high and lifted up. Isaiah 7, his virgin birth. Isaiah 9, his birth in many names. Isaiah 11, his humble origins and lowly beginnings. Isaiah 40, he was preceded by a forerunner. Isaiah 42, his humble demeanor, his gentle ways. Isaiah 49, his divine commission, his tireless service. Isaiah 50, his faithful teaching and full obedience to the Father. And now here in Isaiah 52 and 53 is the fourth 
servant song. Isaiah 42, 49, 50, and now 52 and 53 are the four major servant songs that speak of the Lord Jesus Christ. This is the high watermark. This is God's commentary on the death of His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. This servant song actually begins at the end of chapter 52, beginning in chapter 52, verse 13. It extends all the way through Isaiah 53, 15 verses. This literary unit stands as a whole. It is divided into five sections of three verses each. Perfect symmetry, perfect literary beauty, As it is written, it is done so to reflect the perfection of the atonement of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I want to begin at the beginning. I want to begin in chapter 52, verse 13. This is one of those places where it is a very unfortunate chapter division. I want to give you five headings for each of these stanzas of three verses each. And this first stanza is supreme exaltation. What Isaiah does is he begins at the end. Uh, This is like a biography that begins with the last scene of the person's life. In this case, it begins with the exaltation of the servant. Note verse 13, behold, in other words, Draw your attention to this. Do not let this pass you by. Behold, my servant, as this servant is the Lord Jesus Christ, who has come to do the will of the Father. His food is to do the work and the will of the Father who has sent him. My servant will prosper. He will be extraordinarily successful in the mission for which the Father has sent him. He will be triumphant. He will be victorious. It will be mission accomplished. He will be high and lifted up and greatly exalted. The very words that are used of Christ in Isaiah chapter 6, John 12, 41 tells us that Isaiah wrote of Christ, he will be high, exalted, lifted up, magnified, triumphant, with all authority in heaven and earth, entrusted to him, King of kings, Lord of lords, holding the keys of death and the grave in one hand, and holding the affairs of providence in the other presiding over heaven and earth, the judge of all, high and lifted up. But in verse 14, it now takes an unexpected twist. Just as many were astonished at you, this high and exalted and lifted up servant of Yahweh, They are astonished. Here is why his appearance was marred more than any man. He so suffered, was so opposed, so beaten, so whipped, so brutalized, so abused, so mutilated, so scourged, so whipped that he is unrecognizable at the end as even being a human being as he suffered inhuman cruelty. Verse 15, as a result of this marring, thus he will sprinkle many nations. The language here is of a blood sacrifice under the Levitical priesthood service in which they would slay an innocent substitute and take the blood and sprinkle the mercy seat with the blood, making or picturing an atonement for sin. This horrific death 
that this servant would suffer, his blood, he would be so shattered that his blood will sprinkle to the ends of the earth. His blood will sprinkle many nations and kings who preside over these nations. Verse 15, will shut their mouths on account of him. Listen, kings speak, kings decree, kings legislate, kings give orders, kings have their mouths open and their subjects listen. But in this case, as they are told of the mission of this servant, when they hear the account of it, it will be jaw-dropping. They will be silenced at this King of kings and Lord of lords for what had not been told them, they will see, and what they had not heard, they will understand that this sovereign, this Lord will suffer such deprecation and such misery. I trust that as we gather this morning that every one of us will continue to be gripped with astonishment and amazement at this story that one so high and lifted up would bow down so low upon the cross. We move now to chapter 53, to the second stanza of this servant's song. And we move from his supreme exaltation to his severe rejection. A different speaker is now heard It is the voice of the believing remnant who will be the recipients of the merit of his death upon the cross. Who has believed our message? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? Those who will be given eyes to see and those who will be given ears to hear and those who will be given faith to believe in this mission of this servant who would die in the place of sinners. They will take this message and they will go far and wide and they will fulfill a commission that will be entrusted to them to be servants of the Most High and to go into the highways and into the byways and to lift up their voice and to tell of Christ crucified, this glorious King lifted up who has suffered upon the cruel cross. But who has believed? So few, such a small remnant has believed. Here's the reason why in verse 2. Note it starts with the word for, F-O-R, which introduces the explanation to verse 1. Here's why so few have believed our message Here's why so few believe your message when you speak to your family, to your classmates, to your neighbors. For he, referring to my servant, grew up before him, the father, like a tender shoot. No one took notice of him. He was like a twig, a bit of vegetation emerging from the dust. He was not regal in the manner with which he came. He came with such obscurity and lowliness and like a root out of parched ground. He came from such a common background. He was not born in a palace, but in a manger with animals. He came from obscure circumstances. Can any good thing come from Nazareth? He has no stately form or majesty. Zero. None. That we should look upon Him, nor appearance that we should be attracted to Him. 
He did not come like a rock star. He had no star power. He had no shtick. He had no glamour. He did not look like a mighty Messiah. He had no swagger about him. Verse 3, he was despised, considered so unworthy of anyone's trust. He was forsaken of men, intentionally rejected. No one has ever been more despised or forsaken than him. No one ever started out so high in the heights of glory and ended up so low and forsaken. He was a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. He wept over Jerusalem. He felt the weight of the human trauma. He was weighed down by sorrows. Please note it's in the plural, a man of sorrows. It's an intensive plural. Sorrow upon sorrow, like waves of sorrow swept over his soul. And like one from whom men hide their face, he was despised, and we did not esteem him. This is the message of the believing remnant. We did not esteem him until our eyes were at last opened to him. He was too repulsive to look upon, too loathsome, too hideous, such that men intentionally looked away rather than upon him. It is no different today. The vast majority of people in the world still despise him and still reject him. His holy name is still the butt of jokes and still joined with curse words. His gospel invitations still go unanswered. Who has believed our report? We come now to the third stanza. I want to call it his saving intercession. As we move now beyond his upbringing and the pedestrian-like nature of his life, these verses, these next three verses take us deep into the heart of the message of the gospel. Verse 4, surely, with certainty, truly, truly, I say unto you, it is a trustworthy statement. Surely, our griefs he himself bore and our sorrows he carried. As I was sitting on the front pew before we began this morning, I pulled my pen out of my pocket, and as I went through verses 4 through 6, I just underlined all the pronouns to see the contrast in every line of verses 4 through 6, from the plural pronoun to the singular pronoun, our, he, our, he, we, him, he, our, he, our, our, him, we, his, we, us, 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 him. Here is the substitution. Here is his saving substitution. He stood in our place. He took our sins upon himself. He bore our sins in his body upon the tree. Surely our griefs, griefs here speaking of the consequences of sin. Sin always brings grief. Sin always brings sorrow. Our griefs, he himself, no one else, it wasn't subbed out. It wasn't delegated to one of the angelic beings. It wasn't passed down to one of the prophets, but he himself, he all by himself. Here is the exclusivity of the death of the Savior on behalf of his people. 
He himself bore our griefs. He bore them like a a heavy load. The mountains of our sin dropped upon him. The weight of our sins he carried. Yet we ourselves esteemed him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. We once saw him with eyes of unbelief, and we saw him in a different light. We saw him suffering merely as a martyr. We saw him suffering like Barabbas, suffering for the consequences of his own sin under the judgment of God. Verse 5, but he was pierced. He was pierced through for our transgressions. This speaks of crucifixion prophetically 700 years before the crucifixion of Christ. His hands and his feet were pierced with nails. His side was pierced by a spear. His brow was pierced with a crown of thorns. His back was pierced with a whip. His face was pierced by the fists of Roman soldiers. He was pierced through. Why? For our transgressions, not for his own, for he had no sin. He was crushed for our iniquities. The chastening for our well-being fell upon him. And by His scourging, we are healed. This is the great exchange of of the cross, that our sins, our iniquities, our transgressions were laid upon Him, and it crushed Him. And His righteousness, and His grace, and His healing from the deadly plague of sin was laid upon us. And we were healed from the inside out, from the depths of our being. Verse 6, all of us, all of us, whether you were born in a church, born outside the church, whether you were born in a Christian home, whether you were born in a pagan home, whether you grew up knowing of the name of Christ whether you have just come to faith in Christ, whoever you are from whence ever you have come, all of us, like sheep, just dumb, wayward, lost sheep, defenseless, unable to find our way, subject to perishing, all of us, like sheep, have gone astray, There's a way that seems right to a man, but the end thereof is the end of death. We have gone astray from God, each of us, there are no exceptions to this, has turned to his own way. We've lived for self, for self-pleasure, for self-centeredness, but the Lord has caused the iniquity of us all to fall on Him. It wasn't just placed upon Him. It came crashing down upon Him at Calvary. He died in our place. 1 Corinthians 15, 3, Christ died for our sins. Galatians 1, 4, He gave Himself for our sins. Romans 4, 25, He was delivered over because of our transgressions. John 1, 29, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world 1 Peter 3, 18, Christ died for sin. This is what the cross was all about. As He died in our place, bearing our sins, suffering 
our curse by the shedding of that blood. He satisfied the righteous anger of God toward us. He placated the holy vengeance of God toward us so that the Father is now propitiated by the shedding of His blood on our behalf. He reconciled holy God to sinful man in the blood of His cross And He brought us to God through His cross. And by the shedding of His blood, He went into the slave market of sin, and He shed His blood, and He purchased the church, and He bought us at the price of His own life upon the cross. It was in our place. We stood guilty before holy God. And Christ stood in our place. Have you come to see the sin-bearing, substitutionary, vicarious death of Christ for sinners? I want you to see the fourth stanza. Beginning in verse 7, please note His silent submission. His quiet resolve as the suffering servant, verse 7 speaks of his trials. He was oppressed and he was afflicted as he stood six trials that night, three Jewish trials, three Roman trials, every one of them a travesty of, of justice as he was oppressed and as he was afflicted. Yet he did not open his mouth. There was no protest. First Peter 2, 23, while being reviled, he did not revile in return. While suffering, he uttered no threats. He would not die as a hero. He would die with all of the shame of our sins. Like a lamb that is led to slaughter, we all like sheep have gone astray. And yet now Christ is this, this lamb like a sheep that is silent before its shears as the lamb goes to the slaughterhouse to be, to be, mute, to be brutalized, to be butchered. So He did not open His mouth. He was not a roaring lion as He went to the cross. He was a silent lamb. And the reason for this is He is standing in our place. And when sinners stand before holy God on the last day and their names are not in the book of life and the books are open and all of their sin will come out, Romans 3 verse 19 says, every mouth will be shut on the last day. There will be no excuses offered to God. And so now, as Christ dies in our place, He too must be silent before God. Verse 8 speaks of the sentence. Verse 7, the trials. Verse 8, the death sentence by oppression and judgment, the judgment of Pilate. He was taken away. He was taken away to be publicly executed, to be crucified, to be put to death as a statement of the Roman Empire that this man is is an insurrectionist. This man is a blasphemer. This man must be publicly shamed and put to death, and he must carry his cross through the streets of Jerusalem that all will see. His rebellion. We then see His death as He comes to Calvary, as He mounts Golgotha. And as for His generation who considered that He was cut off, means severed from life, 
that he was cut off out of the land of the living. None, virtually none, such a small group in that generation understood what was taking place. For the transgression of my people to whom the stroke was due. He was the just dying for the unjust. He was the sinless one dying for sinners. He was the creator dying for his sinful creatures. Verse 9 speaks of his burial. In the unfolding of this account, his grave was assigned with wicked men. The Jews intended to have Christ even further disgraced in his burial, that he would be buried with the thieves. Yet, nevertheless, but instead, yet, he was with a rich man in his death. God purposed that there would be an honorable death, a burial for his son who died such an ignominious death. And here is the reason why, because he had done no violence, nor was there any deceit in his mouth. Christ, in his silent submission, models for us what true submission to God looks like. As he turns the other cheek, as he does not retaliate, as he denies himself rather than demanding his rights, this silent submission, finally his successful mission, or his silent submission, now finally his successful mission. The final three verses of this servant song, it has now come full circle. It now ends where it began. It now concludes where chapter 52, verse, verse uh, 13 began with the exaltation and the triumph of this servant. Here is the last stanza, and we see the ultimate triumph and the the success of his suffering and substitutionary death. Note verse 10, but the Lord was pleased to crush him. Who crucified the Lord Jesus Christ? Yes, there were secondary means. There were the Jews. There were the Romans. There were the crowd that cried out, crucify him, crucify him. But they were only secondary means. The primary agent in the crucifixion was none other than God the Father Himself. The Lord was pleased, not reluctant, but pleased to crush Him, putting Him to grief. We know that it was according to the predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God. He was the Lamb of God slain from before the foundation of the world. This was the Father's plan of salvation for sinners like you and me to enter into saving relationship with God that the Father would crush His Son on our behalf. If he would render himself as a guilt offering, if Christ would give himself unto death, and let us remember this, his life was not taken. His life was freely given. He said in John 10, verse 18, I have authority to lay my life down, and I have authority to take it back up again. This commandment I have received from the Father. His blood was not spilt. His blood was poured out upon Calvary's cross. He was not a victim. He was a victor at the cross. If he would render himself as a guilt offering, What will be the result? What will be the effect? 
Notice the lineup here in this parallelism of Hebrew literature. Number one, he will see his offspring. Who is this offspring? It is you and me who have been birthed into his kingdom by his sovereign grace, those for whom Christ has died. He will see his offspring. And by the way, this speaks of a resurrection, does it not? For one who is dead cannot see. Only one who is alive, who has been raised from the dead, can see his offspring. Oh, he came out of that tomb, a risen, living, victorious Savior. Oh, for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross. Note second, he will prolong his days. Another reference to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. He will live forever. He will see life after death. The Lord will prolong His days throughout all of the ages to come. And the good pleasure of the Lord, referring to God the Father, will prosper in His hand. That word prosper was used in chapter 52, verse 13, the very first line of this servant song, behold, my servant will prosper. And now it comes full circle. At the end, the good pleasure of the Lord will prosper in His hand. The Father will reward Him with untold blessing and the spoils of victory. Verse 11, as a result of the anguish of His soul, as a result of the painful suffering of Christ in His work upon the cross, He will see it and be satisfied because it will be a triumphant death. Not a drop of blood will be spilt in defeat. He will purchase the church with His own blood, and He will be satisfied with the accomplishment of His labor upon the cross by the knowledge of, by by His knowledge, the righteous one, my servant, will justify the many. As already has been said in this conference, by His active obedience and His passive obedience to the will of the Father and to the law of God, He has secured righteousness. This righteous one has secured righteousness for the many. And all for whom he died upon that cross, he will at the appointed time of their entrance into the kingdom, he will justify the many. The Father will look upon him and justify us. The many who believe, the many who are justified are the many for whom he died. as He will bear their iniquities. Verse 11, as He will bear their iniquities, He will carry them as a heavy load, as He will bear not only their sin, but the punishment for that sin and the guilt for that sin. Verse 12, it concludes, therefore, as a result of His substitution in our place upon the cross, I, God the Father, is now the speaker, will allot Him, God the Son, a portion with the great. He will be greatly rewarded. As a conquering king, He will have a king's inheritance. And he will divide the booty with the strong. The spoils of victory belong to him. And he will now disperse his grace and his forgiveness and his righteousness and his pardon and his redemption and his reconciliation. He will disperse it to it, to us as the spoils of his victory. Here is why. Here is why. Because... He poured out Himself to death like a drink offering, poured out upon the altar 
He poured out himself to death and was numbered with the transgressors. He identified with us as sinners upon that cross. He was numbered among us as he bore our sins. Yet he himself bore the sin of many and interceded for the transgressors. One who intercedes stands between two parties who have had a falling out. One who intercedes acts as a mediator. One who intercedes must be impartial to both sides or it will not be a fair mediation. Else he will represent one side to the expense of the other side. In our last lecture, we so wonderfully heard why the God-man If Jesus is to be our mediator and to stand between God and stand between man and intercede and bring the two parties together in mediation, He must be fully God in order to represent God to man, but He must be fully man in order to represent man to God. He was fully God, yet fully man, not 50% God, not 50% man, but 100% God, 100% man. Only Jesus could have done what He did for us upon that cross. And we give glory to His name. Not only was He the only one, the only one who could have entered into this intercession and represented God to us and us to God, but He was willing to do so. And He gave Himself unto death on our behalf. I want to say it again as I did last night. There is salvation in no other name. For there is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. We must be under the blood in order to be under the blessing of God. And there is one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself. Did you hear that? Who gave himself. His life was not taken. He gave himself as a ransom for many upon that cross. Have you come to believe in Him? Have you come to entrust your life to Him? Have you been converted to the Lord Jesus Christ? Oh, I plead with you, if you have never been converted to the Lord Jesus Christ, turn from your sin You need a mediator. You need an intercessor. You need one to represent you before God. He is our advocate. He is the friend of sinners. And I want you to know that he has never lost a case. And all who will put their trust and their faith in him, he will represent us before the Father. And through the perfection of His substitutionary death on our behalf, we are clothed in His righteousness and we find acceptance before holy God and we are received before the throne of grace and there we shall be forever and ever and ever. All because of the triumph of His death as our substitute upon the cross. Let us give glory. Let us give glory. Let the redeemed say so. Let us give glory to our Savior, for He has done it, and He has won the victory for His people forever and ever and ever. Amen.